So I manage these funds, uh, you know, gold, silver, Bitcoin related, all designed to protect investors from what I feel is a high probability certainty. And that is that our governments are out of control and that they are systematically set up to print and debase the currency and that inflation has been a problem of late. And it's, sadly, it's going to become a bigger problem over time. And therefore, because of that, you know, because of the mathematics around that, people who are investing and trying to save for the future really need to understand this issue and need to understand the kind of investments they can select that will protect them from that inflation. Welcome to another episode of the Block Reward Podcast. Our guest this week is one of my favorite Bitcoin minds, Lawrence Lepard. Lawrence is a career investment manager who has throughout his career, transitioned towards a focus on sound money and is unique in the Bitcoin community uh, in that he first was kind of a gold bug and prior to discovering Bitcoin. And so he's one of the best people I think you can find to listen for an educated and balanced opinion in comparing gold and Bitcoin. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the comparison and uh, the pros and cons of, of gold and Bitcoin as, as they relate to each other and take that in the context of, of Larry's opinions about what's happening in the market and in the global financial system in general. So Larry has a, has a lot of valuable perspectives to offer in terms of understanding what is going on, skyrocketing government debt, and what it means for the likelihood of inflation persisting forward and just being a condition that investors, and just regular people who are trying to survive, need to understand and prepare for. So uh, that's kind of where we're gonna go with this next hour. I hope you enjoy Larry as much as I do. Thank you for tuning in and here we go. All right, welcome to another episode of the Block Reward Podcast. Today, our guest is Lawrence Lepard. Larry is a lifetime investor, a manager of a number of different investment funds, investment uh, personality, and uh, and much more. Welcome, Larry. Hey, very nice to be with you, Scott. And thanks for having me on your show. Thank you again for coming on. For our listeners who are new to Bitcoin or maybe new to you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we... Uh... Yeah, sure. I'll try, I'll try and keep it brief. So... I've spent my entire career as an investment manager, you know, primarily actually before 2008, I was a venture capitalist uh, investing in high tech things, you know, all the way back to 81 when I started in the business, you know, floppy disk drives and so forth. And then kind of the last run I had was all the dot com stuff in the internet growth area of 93 to 2000, the early 2000s. And I kind of retired in the early 2000s, 2003, four area and was just uh, managing my own investments. And um, in 2008 happened, the, the great financial crisis. And uh, I kind of got radical for sound money. When I saw them bail out the banks, I saw the QE, I saw the amount of money they printed, I saw the zero interest rate policy, a light bulb went off my head. I said, oh my God, I get, I know what this means. This means that I haven't saved enough money because they're going to debase this stuff. And so I, I did a deep dive at the time into uh, gold and silver and gold and silver mining companies because I was looking for investing to invest in an area that had a macro tailwind, which, which is to say something that would benefit from the inflation that I was pretty certain all that money printing was going to lead to. And I was right. It did lead to inflation. It came in funny ways. It came inflation financial assets. Now it's more inflation everywhere. But uh, at the time, it started off in just inflation in stocks and so forth. And um, so I've, I've been managing this fund uh, since that time. And uh, as, as time has gone by, I was aware in the early days of Bitcoin, I wasn't able to really buy it because I didn't, well, I didn't figure out the whole paper wallet and so on and so forth issue in 09 and 11, and I wasn't mining it or any of that kind of stuff. But when Coinbase came public and you could actually uh, buy it, I almost got trapped in Fort Gox, um, um, is it Fort Gox or uh, Mount Gox? Mount Gox. Yeah, I had all the forms. So I was about to send them money and they failed. I was very lucky, kind of dodged a bullet. God was looking out for me. And then Coinbase came along and they 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 were selling it. Okay, I should buy some of this. I started studying it. And, and as, as time has gone by, my views have evolved such that, you know, I always thought gold and silver were just the best forms of sound money. And that would be all I would need. And I've now added Bitcoin to that arsenal. And as I think we've discussed offline, in many ways, Bitcoin is even better, in some ways worse. But um, and we can talk about that. But so I so I manage these funds, uh, you know, gold, silver, Bitcoin related, all designed to protect investors from what I feel is a high probability certainty. And that is that our governments are out of control and that they are systematically set up to print and debase the currency and that inflation has been a problem of late. And it's, sadly, it's going to become a bigger problem over time. And therefore, because of that, you know, because of the mathematics around that, People who are investing and trying to save for the future really need to understand this issue and need to understand the kind of investments they can select that will protect them from that inflation. So that's that's kind of my background. 
Yeah, you mentioned 2008, and I I wonder sometimes if the fact that things didn't really blow up at that point has sort of given a lot of people this feeling that the party can go on forever because it it didn't pop in 2008. And and actually, after kind of a short dip, there was really a a run then again of asset appreciation. We know it's inflation, but the nominal price of for asset holders, it was a great run after. Yeah, no, that's right. Well, the, the Federal Reserve is kind of a serial bubble blower. I mean, you know, when LTCM blew up in 1998, they they blew the dot-com bubble in 2000. And then, you know, that burst. And then so Bernanke turned and cut rates down to 1%. And they blew the U.S. housing bubble. And uh, Wall Street got all levered up on housing. And of course, the house, price of houses could never go down and never gone down, they said. But they forgot to study back to the 30s when it went down quite a bit. They went down quite a bit. And then that bubble burst. And, and now we're in what I call the everything bubble, which is to say, you know, the sovereign currencies at risk because by taking, you know, the ZERP interest rates that they enacted in 2008, they, they held that at that level. I mean, it would have been one thing if they did it shortly. I mean, I get it. You know, things were falling apart. So we have to take these emergency measures to make sure the ATMs still work. I, I get that. But, you know, I would have imagined that would have lasted a year and then, okay, things are back to normal. We'll, we'll put everything back to normal. No, they actually held interest rates low from 08 all the way up into 15, 16. Then they started to increase them and then they had to pivot and drop them again. And then COVID came and they dropped them again. And as we know, they, they increased their balance sheet throughout the entire time frame. More or less, there was a, a brief period of runoff. And so, you know, it, it's... Um, it's just been, it, you know, and, and this is the way, this is the math. You know, if you go to my Twitter feed, my pinned tweet shows you that, you know, when, you, when you're in a debt-based system, when you've got monetary, a monetary system that's based on debt is used to create money and debt is used to grow the system, it's like a shark. You got to keep swimming or you're going to die. You got to have more and more money constantly entering the system. And that more and more money, by definition, is really inflation. And so if you're, you know, the average working person or the average retiree or, or really anybody and you're trying to save, you're always trying to save in, in terms that can beat that inflation. And it's very hard and it's very unfair because it makes it hard to retire. It makes it hard because the people at the bottom are the last ones to get the pay raises. And it's, it very much advantages the people at the top because they can borrow very cheaply and use that cheap money to buy productive assets. And so that's a that's an enormous unfair unfairness, and that's what's led to a lot of the injustice. And I think a lot of the strife in the world right now is the fact that you know the world is being run by by people who have set up the, they've rigged the system in their own favor. I think that people also are at a little bit of an unfair disadvantage because of sort of the, the disingenuous way that the media tends to describe inflation. You know, we we hear about inflation targets or inflation coming down. It like it gives the average listener the the impression that things are think you know the price of eggs or gasoline or whatever is is going to return to yeah, the ex ante condition. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Look, I mean, you know, inflation never really, I mean, never goes negative, very rarely goes negative. But to be fair, the, you know, it is waves. I mean, you know, gasoline here was six or seven dollars, you know, I don't know, at the peak after after the COVID inflation. And now it's back down to four and a half, five. I mean, but I'm quite sure on the next run up, it'll go to eight or nine. And, you know, I, I mean, we, you know, look, when I when I was a kid in high school, gasoline was 25 cents a gallon. You know, when I was in college, gas was a dollar a gallon, you know, and, and so it's, it's kind of a relentless you know, March, nom- March in nominal terms, high, higher. And that's that's not really, I mean, like, it's the same gallon of gas I put in my car today as I did 30 years ago. Uh, the difference is that there's just a lot more currency units being used to chase it. And so the price per per gallon is just a lot higher. And, and that's that's what we're all fighting against. That's the, that's the flaw in the Keynesian system. I mean, the Keynesian system is, you know, Keynes was all about growth. And in reality, and as most Bitcoiners know, and, and a lot of sound money people know and understand, you know, the healthiest economy isn't really about a growing economy. It's about an efficient economy. You want, you know, getting more for less is what's good. And that's based on productivity and that's based on sound money and that's based on setting prices correctly. Uh, and sadly, you know, there are, it's one in a hundred or, you know, very few of the, of the, almost none of the politicians and one in a hundred of just average people who understand that, you know, and so we, you know, we, we get, we get led into all these fights over stuff that doesn't even matter because the money's not sound. That's the that's the core problem. Yeah. So what, when the money is this unsound, it sort of it makes it impossible for the market to figure out what the price of anything should be. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's almost it's almost like funny money. You know, it's it's extremely hard. And and if you can see, I mean, there are a lot of charts that show this in visual form. I mean, you know, I can't imagine. I mean, if, if, if you go back and you look at a lumber chart as an example over the past 10 years, I mean, it's like it looks like a, a heart attack. It's, I mean, it, it just, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, and so imagine being somebody growing and producing lumber or imagine being somebody building houses and using lumber as an input. 
And, you know, your input cost can go up 400% and then it can fall 70% and it just zigzags back and forth. I mean, when you've got mispricing of things in economies, it's, it's extremely difficult to plan and, and produce good outcomes because you just, you, you don't know what to expect. And, and the reason that those kind of zigzags occur is the broken monetary system. Another thing I think is a, a topic worth touching on that, I, that isn't super well understood is most people are aware or they were alive and remember that interest rates were higher and went even higher, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So that there's this idea that it'll be fine again because that has already happened once before. But structurally, the conditions of the the market today are just not analogous at all to what was going on at that time. That's a great, great point. Yeah. I mean, and and that's, you know, the people who say we don't have real problems here. And even this, you know, as high up as Jay Powell, who's the Fed chairman, you know, says, well, we'll just do what Paul Volcker said, you know, did. Well, you know, we get it. Um, You know, okay, maybe the money supply did grow too quickly, but we'll rein it all in with high interest rates. We'll create a very positive real interest rate. And, you know, the money will become sound again and we'll have, you know, 40 years of deflation like we did from 1980 to 2020. The problem with that line of thinking is that when Volcker did what he did in 1980, and he took interest rates at 20% and almost bankrupted my dad's business because he had a big inventory he carried as a retailer. When he did that, you know, the federal government debt was 25, 20, 25% of GDP. And right now, the federal government does 130% of GDP. And so we can't realistically take interest rates where we need to take them to return soundness to the money without blowing up the fiscal deficit in the United States, i.e., you know, and, and you can see this if you just go to Google and put in, you know, a chart of U.S. federal government interest expense, you'll see what kind of looks like a parabola pointed towards the sky. And so, you know, by by trying to solve the problem that they last time solved with higher interest rates, with higher interest rates this time, well, the problem is that they, you know, after 40 years of debt-fueled growth, we've now got too much debt to do that. And so what's, what has drawn us into is we're in a sovereign debt crisis where, as I said earlier, the issue this time is we're at the everything bubble level and either the debt's going to be made good or the currency is going to be worthless. And it's, it's a choice. It, you know, for the debt to be made good, we could push it all up, but everyone would go bankrupt and interest rates would be extremely high. Or we can decide that we're going to keep interest rates low and keep printing money to keep the system going, but inflation is going to run wild. And so the Federal Reserve and the other monetary authorities are really kind of painted into a corner um, and that they can't get out of. And, and that's what you know, informs my view of why you've got to have sound money right here, right now. And and this is, um, you know, it's been seen in a lot of different financial metrics. And what's difficult for most people to understand is they tend to, the average person, the average investor tends to look at any given event or any situation and say, well, what happened yesterday? What happened the year before? What happened the year before that? And we've had 40 years of deflation. We've had 40 years of low inflation. We haven't run into one of these things in a long time. To see something like this, you have to go back and you have to look at the 1970s, or you have to look at the sovereign debt crises of the 1910s, 20s, and 30s when you know Britain came off the gold standard. And um, what you see in those cases is, you know, almost universally, when the debt to GDP gets as high as it is right now, you're either going to have a complete collapse and default on the debt, uh, unlikely though, because we can print it. Or you're going to print and have massive inflation and reset everything to a much higher nominal level so that the debt becomes a smaller percentage of GDP. It's kind of confusing, but it's but it's pretty, if you take the time to study it, pretty certainly true. You know, what it suggests is that we're kind of at the end game or very close to the end game of this long experiment with debt-fueled growth. That, that's, kind of, that's kind of where I see us right now. And if politicians are given the choice of the two, sort of the, the more the, the easier political path is to debase the currency and keep the appearances of everything rolling along as long as possible, because pivoting to a austerity policy would be so painful for people and cutting social programs and everything else. I think that's right. I mean, it's not impossible. Anything is possible in this world. You know, they could they could drive us into a 1930s style collapse. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the average politician faced with instant death based on collapse or a lot of complaining and slower death based on inflation, they'll choose inflation all day long. You know, it's it's the can kicking mentality of the political class, right? So you see these headlines asking the question, the rhetorical question of, you know, will we be able to stick the soft landing? <laughs> and and it's like yeah. the, pl- the plane doesn't even have any wheels. Oh, no, the plane, the plane isn't the plane's a, It's a mess. Yeah. I mean, the controls are sloppy. The plane is a fugoid. We're going up. We're going down. We don't know what we're doing. I mean, 
look, we, you know, they grew the money supply 42% in the COVID area era. You know, the, the inflation that they said didn't exist. And then they said it was transitory, went from zero or 1% to 9% within months, you know, and now it's crashed from 9% back down to three. Um, and, and they're getting, in my view, they're getting ready to declare victory. They're getting ready to say, oh yeah, look, we solved it. You know, that's what the U.S. stock market rally today um, was all about. But I, I don't think they have solved it. I think that there's a fundamental underlying inflation issue. I mean, to me, the biggest event that really occurred in the last few years is that the March 2020 uh, COVID event and the response to that, I think, kicked us out of a long-term deflationary trend. And while there are many technologies that are deflationary, and while I agree with Jeff Booth that we live in a deflationary technical world, um, I think it, for brief periods of time, when the system is is quaking in its boots, as it is right now, there will be inflation. There has to be inflation because the alternative is collapse. And so it, to me, it's only a matter of time, you know, until the Fed has to resume the path that they were on in the COVID area, which is to say reversing QT, growing their balance sheet, dropping interest rates and trying to stimulate the economy. And we've already seen signs of this. I mean, they've now kind of said it's now pretty obvious that they've stopped raising rates. Um, and, and so, you know, we they're signaling that they're close to, to being there because and, and they've also done a lot of signaling that, hey, you know, we've licked this inflation problem. They have Paul Krugman came out and say, hey, we've solved it. You know, and then you've got other economists to say, hey, you know, maybe 3% is as good as two, you know, so we're getting close. So you can see, you know, the politicians tend to respond to whatever the, the loudest noise is. And obviously, a year or two ago, inflation was the loudest noise, and they made a lot, and they had to respond. You know, wait until we start to have layoffs, wait until, you know, uh, other bad things start to happen in the economy, the banking system starts to break, you know, everyone starts to realize the stock market starts to come unglued and everyone's earning or savings and retirement starts to go down a lot in value. You know, they'll, they'll be terrified of the outcome if they don't. Yeah. One, one of my favorite phrases is QE is welfare for the asset rich. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, it's terribly sad. I mean, what, what happened in 2008, in my opinion, was just an enormous crime. I mean, just just enormous. I mean, it's, you know, it was rugged capitalism for all the poor homeowners. It was a great, I had it on my Twitter feed at one point in time. There was a great house photo, a photo of a house in, uh, I think it was in the Western US, maybe Las Vegas area. And it was spray painted on the door, said three tours in Iraq, in Iraq, or it said foreclosed. You know, this is spray paint on a garage door of a house in a development. Foreclosed, three tours in Iraq, but no bailouts for people like me. And it was obviously a veteran who'd lost his house, you know, in the in the GFC. And, you know, but if you were, you know, Lloyd Blankfein or you ran Jamie Dimon or you ran a New York bank, you were back in business and making millions and millions, ultimately billions instantly because the government gave you money. And so, you know, it's just a, a blatantly corrupt system that rewarded, you know, those who had access to the printer and access to the political power and let the rest of us all hang out and, and hit the wall. You know, these guys, this poor guy had his house foreclosed on because he obviously couldn't make the payments or whatever happened. So yeah, it's 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 tragic. It's really, it's wrong. It's tragic. It's sad. And it's what will get fixed by the movement that's taking place right now in the whole sound money area, this gold and Bitcoin movement. I mean, we are going to fix the money um, because it, it has to be fixed. And, and more importantly, it's not just that we're going to fix it. It's that the existing system is going to fail. And then what will happen is everyone will realize that it needs to be fixed and they will come into the sound money arena that we operate in. I find sometimes the idea of, of the money failing is a triggering concept that a lot of people don't even want to comprehend. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. And it's and I get accused of being a doomer. And I hate this. I hate that term because, you know, I'm an analyst. I, I just try and figure shit out. And, you know, look, if you were standing, you know, if you had all the, you know, the meteorological tools and you were standing on the coast of, a, of an island and you could look out with radar and all the other stuff and you could see a hurricane coming and you said, you know, there's a hurricane coming and the wind's going to be 150 miles an hour and the waves are going to be huge and this, that and the other. And I mean, some people might look at you if they didn't know what you had in terms of the tools and say, hey, you're a doomer. But, but the fact of the matter is, you know, if you look at the tools, you do the analysis, the goddamn hurricane is coming. You know? And that's that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, I'm not a doomer. I'm telling folks that look based on, you know, this is this is not, that's the other thing, Scott, this is not some unknown pattern. I mean, the, what we are seeing happen right now with the U.S. currency, the, the you know, the world's reserve currency and the U.S. dollar, we've seen this happen at a microcosm level in other countries. I mean, there are other countries that spend too much money, print money to cover up the deficit, monetize the debt, and then the currency 
ultimately trends toward worthlessness. I mean, this this has happened a hundred times in the last hundred and fifty years. I mean, you know, Venezuela. I mean, it's happening in Turkey right now. It's happening. It just happened. It's happening in Argentina right now. It happened in Zimbabwe, you know, a while ago. It happened in Weimar in ni- Germany in nineteen twenty three. I mean. This has happened in many places. And so, you know, the pattern recognition is not that difficult when you see a situation where the debt has grown too large, the budget does not balance itself, the issuing authority of the currency realizes that to keep things going, they must print more of the currency. Then what, you know, as you you know and I know, kicks in is something called Gresham's Law. And Gresham's Law suggests that when people, when, when a quorum of the population comes to realize that they can never stop printing money. They just can't. And that that everything we buy is going to be more and more expensive forever, as long as they are printing money, then we will start to vote with our feet and say, you know what? I'm going to only use that money I need to buy, you know, milk and gasoline. But all my savings, I'm not keeping them in bonds. I'm not keeping them in dollars. I'm not keeping them, well, to some degree in stocks. I'm not, I'm not holding them in things that the government can print. Give me something else. Give me a form of money that can't be printed. And of course, the three that logically spring to mind are gold, silver, and Bitcoin. That's maybe a good a good time to transition over and, and talk a little bit about gold and silver as they relate to Bitcoin. You're somebody who uh, does a, you know, there aren't a lot of people that, that really are able to walk that line of advocating for all kinds of sound money. Gold and silver, sometimes there's some partisan camps, you know, the Bitcoiners are like, oh, these gold people, they're all just, you know, troglodytes or you know, Neanderthals and, you know, and, and the the, you know, and the gold people are like, all oh, these Bitcoin people are just a bunch of dreamers and, you know, crypto wizards and full of shit. And, and look, there's, you know, at the extremes, there's some, there's some sense on both sides of that. I mean, one of the biggest things I encountered in talking to gold people about Bitcoin or, you know, yeah, about Bitcoin is just, they look at an FTX as an example. They look at a Sam Bankman free. They say, hey, crypto, yeah, I get it. It's a bunch of fraud. And they're right. I mean, crypto, not Bitcoin, crypto, big difference, has a lot of fraud in it. And Sam Bankman fried was exhibit A. And so, you know, your average gold person, they see that kind of behavior and they go, I, I know what this is. I'm not touching that shit. Okay. And then, you know, in turn, your average Bitcoiner, you know, may look at a gold guy and gold guy isn't even willing to entertain that they, you know, there's something different and say, hey, you're being a troglodyte. You know, you're, you're being old fashioned. You're, you don't have an open mind. And and that's a fair criticism too. And, you know, what, what I have observed is that, you know, I think, and I've tried, I, I view my role in this. I like them both, obviously. They're different. I, I think ultimately Bitcoin is better and ultimately Bitcoin will replace gold, but not, not overnight and, and not even in a couple of years. I mean, it's going to take perhaps decades, but they, they, they're they parallel. And I view gold as analog sound money and Bitcoin as digital sound money. And we live in a digital world. And for a lot of different reasons, I think Bitcoin is superior to gold. And I think it will outperform gold um, in part because um, it's, it's, it's facing an adoption curve. I mean, gold's fully adopted, right? It's been around 5,000 years. It's not like there's anyone who hasn't heard of gold. Uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of people who haven't heard of Bitcoin. And they're going to hear about it. And they're going to say that want some of that. And there are only 21 million of them. And they're going to, as they go to get it, they're going to have to pay more for it. But I think that when I try and talk to people in the gold world about Bitcoin, and then, you know, I, I encounter a couple of things. One of the things they often say is, well, it's not tangible. You can't touch it. Well, yeah, okay. But but what is money really? It's just a ledger. I mean, you know, the, the bank, the money in your bank account, you can't touch that. You don't touch your money in your credit card. You, I mean, some people carry cash, but most people are dealing with just ledgers. You're just keeping score. You know, and even back in the caveman days, you know, guys were marking things on walls. You know, I killed three bison, you killed one, you owe me two. You know, that there was no money there. There wasn't even gold at that point. They really hadn't found it or mined it. So, you know, money is a social obligation amongst people. If you have it, it gives you the right to to buy exchange it for something. So I've always viewed money as a ledger, not necessarily a physical thing. Now it turned out gold was an element that became a very good physical representation of the ledger because you could see it, know it, it was indestructible, you know, etc. So that that's why you know, and it was rare, and there was it, the supply wasn't growing very quickly. The stock to flow was low, so that's why you know gold was at a um, you know became adopted as universally been adopted by mankind as money. Um, but what I say to gold people that I think they often miss is that what they're looking at with respect to Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is a technical innovation, actually an invention or a discovery, maybe is a different way of saying it. And and the, what is it? The discovery is the notion of quote unquote provable digital scarcity. So if you think of things that are digital, like, you know, files on your computer or sound bites or, you know, um, I don't know, sound songs or whatever, you know, everything digital, photograph, everything digital is copyable. You make a million copies of some digital, you just push, you know, copy. But what if you had something that was digital that couldn't be copied, that you knew how many there were, you knew where they were, you knew that you couldn't, you know, there was no way to falsify one and you could send it and transfer it to anybody anywhere, you know, in a sense, 
What if you had a quote unquote digital form of, of a gold like thing where the stock to flow was very low? In fact, ultimately, the stock to flow would become you know, infinite because there, there'll be no flow at some point when we get to the last coin being mined. And you knew it was provable, you knew it was immutable, and you could see it. You know, everyone, anyone could audit it and see it at, at any point in time. Well, that's what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin, you know, they used a, a bunch of different technologies, cryptography, you know, computing power, you know, hashing, use of a nonce, a, a lot of other things, including a difficulty adjustment, et cetera, to, to basically create a provable, digitally scarce thing, which is one Bitcoin. And there are 21 million of them in the system. There will never be any, well, they're not yet. There will be a growing towards that number. And and there'll never be any more of that. And so suddenly, you know, if if everyone kind of decides that, you know what, let's let's act as if these are money. Let's treat these things as money because we know, you know, the most important, as, as Safe pointed out in his book, The Bitcoin Standard, the most important thing about money is that it be scarce. You know, that that you can't, I mean, seashells don't make good money. Sand doesn't make good money. You know, um, anything that there's a lot of doesn't make good money. For something to be money, it has to be hard to produce and scarce which is why gold's such good natural money. And in theory, fiat currency could be good natural money if governments were responsible and they actually didn't overprint it and they made it scarce. But the history is that, that that's not how it works. They, they, they can never resist the temptation to overprint and to create too much money. So, so, but I guess my point is that digital scarcity, it's a big deal. It's like, you know, there was a time when mankind had never flown. I suppose some people had jumped off cliffs, but it didn't really work out well for them. And then suddenly, you know, the Wright brothers had a controllable machine that put a person through the air and things were different. You know, there was a time when people had to, you know, write down on paper, you know, the Bible and copy it by hand. And then Gutenberg invented a press and suddenly it could crank out multiple copies quickly. You know, I mean, there, there, I mean, there were just and, and on and on and on. I mean, there was a time when the telegraph didn't exist. There was a time, you know, when radio didn't exist, when TV didn't exist, there was a time when computers and microprocessors. I mean, all of these things were technical innovations that in some way added value to the human experience. And so what I would suggest is that Bitcoin is a digital technical innovation that solves a very pressing problem, which is, you know, that the monetary authorities can't stop printing money. Now, gold kind of solved that problem, but there are issues with gold um, that, you know, make it a little bit, uh, that make Bitcoin a little bit better. I would in comparing and contrasting the two, though, because I sit at the intersection of both of them, I will say a couple of things. One, one of the benefits that gold has over Bitcoin is that it's final. In other words, once it's been made and you have a gold coin, there's no maintenance. There's nothing you have to do to it. It just sits there. It doesn't absorb energy. It doesn't absorb electricity. It just is. Okay. So that's, and that makes it different than Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is a, is a digitally scarce item, but without the electricity and the network running, it doesn't exist. So there actually is an energy cost associated with keeping Bitcoin alive, and there always will be. Now it's it's small, but but that is a difference between the two the two different you know assets. You mentioned about uh, stock to flow, which is the ratio or relationship between the, the total amount of a commodity and the amount that gets produced in a given year. Correct. With gold, when the price of gold goes up, it, there's a more of an incentive for gold miners to mine more gold. No doubt. But let's, and, and, and one of the arguments Bitcoiners make against gold is they say, well, you know, the price of gold is going to go up and we're going to produce a gazillion ounces of gold and gold's value is going to get diluted. And let me just suggest that that's not entirely how it works. I mean, but, but there is an important point in there. Yes, higher gold prices will mean more gold mines. More gold mines will mean more gold production. Right now, there's about 200,000 tons of gold in the world that have been mined since the beginning of time some of which are in, sitting at the bottom of the ocean, a lot of which are around you know, women's necks in India and around the world. But that 200,000 tons is matched by about 3,000 tons a year that we mine. So you know, we're adding, say, call it 1.5% to the existing flow. And by the way, that's about the rate right now that the block reward on Bitcoin is. It's adding about 1.5% with a halving in April, that'll drop in half. But gold, gold mining is hard. A lot of the easy deposits and all the easy deposits have been mined. We've been doing it for a couple hundred years. It's getting harder and harder to find it, but you can always find it. It's just a matter of the price, right? There's gold, there's gold in the ocean. I mean, and you know, and so um, if the price of gold were to go to $10,000 tomorrow, would we mine more gold? Yeah, we would. But you know, from the time of discovery to the time when a gold mine starts is typically 10 years. And, you know, even if we were to take the gold mining, all the gold mining in the world today, and of course, a lot of, I mean, there's 
you know, billions of dollars of capital invested to mine the 3,000 tons that we mine and double it. You know, we'd still all, which, which is frankly impossible. But, but if we were to do that, it'd probably take 20 years, 10, 20 years to do that. We'd be, instead of stock to flow being one and a half percent, it'd be 3%. So, th- so the notion that suddenly the market's going to be swamped with a ton of new gold as a result of a higher gold price, not going to happen. It's just geologically impossible to happen. But but your point is well taken. Higher prices mean that we will add the gold supply. And, you know, to be fair, in 40 years, there'll be twice as much gold on the earth as there is today that's been mined. Because if we add one and a half percent and compound it for 40 years, we'll, we'll double. And, and by the way, that's another thing I should point out about Bitcoin that I, th- I find so fascinating about it. If you look at commodities, it's, it's probably why it trades the way it does. And why I don't think, you know, we're all living in this big experiment. We've never really seen anything like this. We've never seen anything. We've never seen an asset with a fixed supply, a commodity asset with a fixed supply that does not respond to price. I mean, if you push the price of oil up, we'll find more oil. Corn, more corn. Wheat, more wheat. Gold, more gold. Anything. Oil, more, you know, oil is $500 a barrel. We'll be drilling everywhere. We'll find more oil. You can take the price of Bitcoin to a million dollars a coin. And the issuance is set, not changing. In other words, the supply is an algorithmic, you know, formula that's set. And so we've never really seen anything like that before. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 very unique. Yeah, I mean, it makes me wonder about what that will look like in 2030 or 2040 when the market really more broadly understands what these regular uh, regular recurring supply shocks. Like, what kind of gravity will that have on any other kind of investing that might be going on when you know? Yeah. And what it suggests to me is, I mean, I really do think Saylor's correct when he says, you know, it's going up forever, Laura. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm not at all ashamed. And I know people, I have friends who think I'm crazy, but to say that, you know, I, I see it being out of thousand, you know, very soon. And then I see it being a million in a few more years. And then eventually I see it being 2 million. And then eventually someday maybe it's $10 million a coin. I mean, I, you know, these things are very rare. There are 8 billion people on the planet, the 21 million Bitcoin, you know, and there are, you know, there are, I mean, hell, there are 50 million millionaires. I mean, every millionaire in the world couldn't even own one Bitcoin. There aren't enough to go around. So, you know, it, it, it strikes me that as we get to the stage where more and more people understand the monetary properties of this invention and the importance of those monetary properties, and, and it becomes more, we all collectively accept that, look, this really is a superior form of money. Price is going to be just you know, it's not even going to be in the same zip code that we're in right now, Scott. I mean, it's going to be just a lot higher. Yeah, especially, you know, in the context of what you were mentioning earlier in the conversation about the inescapable predicament that governments are in with respect to having to print more. You know, it gets kind of messy and tricky. I mean, you know, somebody said, well, where do you think Bitcoin is? I mean, hell, Bitcoin could be 10,000 or Bitcoin could be $10 million a coin, but gasoline might also be $1,000 a gallon. I mean, at some point in time, you know, the monetary system itself, I mean, we're we're measuring Bitcoin in dollars because right now the base currency that we, you know, the price that we all look at, you want to know the price of anything in the world, you can do it in dollar prices. We're not measuring in Bitcoin terms because, you know, not enough Bitcoin around, nobody's using it, but not enough people are using it, but we're measuring in dollar terms. But if the dollar hyperinflates, the dollar becomes nearly worthless. I mean, you know, it'll be things will change to the point where, oh, yeah, that house is worth one Bitcoin, you know, or, or, you know, I mean, frankly, I think that'll happen pretty soon. I mean, (laughs) that house is worth a tenth of a Bitcoin or whatever it might be. But this will this will become a new measuring stick. And that's really what money is designed to be. Money is designed to be a measuring stick. You know, a, a unit of money is meant to measure something. It's meant to measure economic energy. And that's part of the reason why when you mess with interest rates and you mess with the underlying money, it'd be like telling a guy building a house, you know, yeah, build this house and build it to these dimensions. Oh, by the way, I'm going to keep screwing around with a yardstick. You know, sometimes it's going to be shorter. Sometimes it's going to be longer. Actually, over time, it's going to continually get longer. You know, well, okay. I mean, how are you going to build the house to spec? I mean, that's... You need, you need a money which you can rely on. You can rely on the supply of it so that the price of everything that you set off of it is accurate. So, the, you know, the underlying thing itself is not changing all the time. There's a good argument that that hyperinflation of everything else against Bitcoin has been happening already for a long time. If you, you know, back to your, your thing about... It really has. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, hey, some guy spent 10,000 Bitcoin for a pizza, you know, in, in the first what we think is the first commercial transaction. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, that pizza is worth billions of dollars today, right? You know, and I mean, I've, I've heard Jeff Booth talk about the value of his lake house in Bitcoin terms. I mean, it's, yeah, every, in Bitcoin terms, everything, in the, you know, either Bitcoin's going up, you know, in dollar values or said a different way, in terms of Bitcoin, everything in the world is getting cheaper. 
because you know there's there's only a fixed amount of bitcoin and this is an interesting point i think to come back to bitcoin and gold because the gold price has been touching all-time highs you know like flirting with all-time highs in us dollars but the gold the gold price in bitcoin has really done what the price of everything else in bitcoin has done as well yeah i know well bitcoin is crushing gold and it's it's for a very obvious reason and that is that it's still heavy early in the adoption curve. I mean, there's some Bitcoiners who think, oh, the, gold, the price of gold is going to fall. Well, I, I can assure you that they're wrong. The price of gold is not going to fall. The price of gold, I mean, monetary debasement, we know that's a certainty, or I believe it's a certainty, and I think I could prove it to anybody given enough time. So given that, in dollar terms, the price of gold is going higher and the price of Bitcoin is going higher. As Paul Tudor Jones says, Bitcoin is the fastest horse in the monetary race. And so they both are going to go up because the dollar, it's really, it's, it's really the dollar going down. The fact that there are more and more dollars chasing, you know, a fixed amount of gold or a relatively fixed amount of gold, a fixed amount of Bitcoin. But the Bitcoin is going up much quicker than the gold and gold is, is, is suffering vis-a-vis Bitcoin in terms of performance for two reasons. Um, well, right now the stock to flow is about equal, but the, the main reason really is just that is the adoption curve. I mean, you know, Bitcoin today is kind of like the internet in 2000. I mean, we're, you know, it's timing is slightly different, but you know, we're 15 years into it, and the first three, four, five years almost didn't count because it was really kind of a toy. Um, but let's call the modern era when Coinbase started selling it in 2013. So, you know, so kind of we're 10 years into the modern era of Bitcoin, you know, and we're kind of maybe not even at the 10% adoption rate. We're somewhere below that. But if you go back and you look at, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's, you know, tipping point argument, you know, when things get to kind of the 10% adoption rate, and then, then quite often you get on a very steep slope, and he's Got some great charts that show how, you know, cell phones or the internet or automobiles or washing machine, whatever it might be, when mankind creates a new invention, there's a period of time where it kind of gets seeded and everyone starts here. And then at some point, everyone goes, oh, wow, that's really good. I need some, I need that. You know, I, I need an automobile. These horses are not cutting it anymore. You know, I need a washing machine. I don't, I'm not going to do this by hand. I need a, I need a cell phone. You know, I mean, in the early days, you know, you had the Wall Street one, the huge phone. I, I had a boss who had one of those. I mean, it was a dollar a minute. You know, well, now you can get unlimited plans for, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks a month. I mean, it's, it, you know, so it, there's a tipping point in the adoption of these things. And we're, we're, in my view, we're at or very close to that point with Bitcoin where it's going to become very, very obvious to people, you know, in the next five years. And, and Bitcoin's going to really appreciate in price because, you know, we're going to get a large number of new buyers coming in. And right now you're in it. I'm in it. There's a hardcore group of us. We all know it, understand it, believe in it. But and, and there are others who want to get in, you know, like the uh, this ETF that I'm sure your listeners are aware of, you know, BlackRock and Fidelity and a number of other big fund companies have applied to have Bitcoin ETFs. I mean, if you're trying to buy Bitcoin today, you have to be somewhat sophisticated and know how to do it. Um, and if you're a registered investment advisor and in the United States, the registered investment advisors control maybe 20 trillion dollars of people's retirement accounts. And if you go to one of those guys, if you have your money there and you go to one of those guys, and say, buy me some Bitcoin, they say, we can't. You know, it's outside of our, it's, it's, it doesn't fit. There's no, there's no ticker symbol. It's not publicly traded, you know, and we're not going to go buy a Trezor and put it on cold stores for you. So, but people say, well, hey, it's been the best performing financial asset the last 10 years. I want some of that. And they say, yeah, we know. That's why our company, Fidelity or BlackRock, that's why we applied for the CTF. Well, that's going to get approved sometime in the next six months. And when it does, suddenly that $20 trillion, some of it's going to go, give me some of the Bitcoin. And as you know, the total market cap today of the Bitcoin, you know, public Bitcoin is, is $700 billion. So if some piece of that 20 trillion says, I, and, and, and by the way, not all of that 700 billion is for sale, right? I mean, some of it's in very deep storage, right? Some of it's been lost, right? Yeah, I think it's a mistake of when people start thinking about the market cap, you know, if Bitcoin 700 billion, if, if another 700 billion come in, that's going to do a lot more than double the price because exactly because there's only of the 700 billion that is there. First of all, let's assume 10 or 20 percent has been lost. And then let's assume 40 or 50 percent. I mean, well, we know for a fact that like 60 or 70 percent hasn't moved in a couple of years. So those are those are hardcore holders. We're not going to sell it when it goes from 35 to 50. Uh, no, no, they're playing for much bigger numbers. And so it's going to take a lot higher prices to shake some loose. So there's probably at any given point in time, you know, maybe only call it a hundred, hundred billion dollars of quote free trading Bitcoin that's for sale at slightly higher prices. And if, you know, some piece of, um, you know, the 20 trillion, let's say, for example, the 20 trillion of, of RIA money, let's say they just make a, um, oh, I don't know, let's say they make a 5% allocation to it should be pretty high. I mean, I don't think they'll start there, but they might get there over time. Well, that would imply there'd be $1 trillion that would a Bitcoin that would need to be bought. 
but okay, but there's 700 billion of total, but only maybe 100 billion of tradable. So 1 trillion wants to buy the 100 billion of tradable. How much does that have to go up in value to fit the two together? You know, that's 10x from here, right? You know, and that's just that's just US RIAs. I mean, wait until you get, you know, the pension funds and the bond funds and international stuff. I mean, you know, to 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 put some bigger numbers around this, Scott, there's about four hundred trillion dollars of financial assets in the world. Four hundred trillion bonds, stocks, cash. That's before real estate. There's another couple hundred trillion of real estate. Four hundred trillion. There's seven hundred billion. So less than one. There's less than one trillion dollars worth of Bitcoin, $700 billion worth of Bitcoin, right? And there's about $12 trillion of gold, but but not all of that's for sale either because a lot of it's in museums and on females next. So maybe call it tradable gold is $4 trillion. So so maybe if you t- round the Bitcoin up to a trillion, take $4 trillion of tradable, there's $5 trillion of sound money assets in the world today, gold and Bitcoin, $5 trillion. There's $400 trillion of financial assets in the world today. So, you know, we're talking about just over 1% of the world's financial assets are sound money assets. So when that $400 trillion, this goes back to my point on Gresham's Law, when that $400 trillion keeps reading the newspapers and keeps seeing the governments act responsibly and keeps seeing the high inflation. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Block Reward. We're trying to do something different here, creating accessible conversations meant for people who aren't obsessed with Bitcoin. If you found this episode informative and engaging, hit that subscribe button to make sure you stay updated with future episodes. Your feedback matters. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a moment to share your reviews and help us with our goal of creating Bitcoin content that is simple and easy to understand. Bitcoin has an important role to play in the future of finance. It will change the way we save, spend, and invest. Discover why Bitcoin offers a game-changing opportunity for forward-thinking employers by visiting blockrewards.ca. BlockRewards' mission is helping Canadian employers implement strategies for integrating Bitcoin into compensation and benefits. Supercharge your recruitment and retention strategies and help your team members plan for the rising cost of living by rewarding their work with the hardest money ever invented. Special thanks to our top sponsor, Paramount Employee Benefits Consulting, Canada's only Bitcoin Forward Benefits and Pension Advisory. For more information, find them at paramountbenefits.ca. Big shout out to Podigy, our production team that makes all this possible, and BMX Escape for producing our music. Bitcoin is an expansive and dense topic many people walk away from early. To Bitcoin enthusiasts looking for that podcast they can share with friends, family, and colleagues, one they'll actually listen to, we hope that is us. The content of these conversations is meant to be provided for information purposes only. Nothing here is investment advice. Bitcoin is a big topic. Be sure to do your own research before making any personal financial decisions. Thanks for listening. 